What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the Pack a Day podcast. I'm your host, Andy Herman. You can follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. You can follow the podcast at Pack a Day Podcast. Once again, joined by the one and only Mike Wall, who joins us once again to break down some film, talk some Packers. Mike, it is great to have you back on the show. Thanks so much for joining me today. Yeah, thanks absolutely for having me and uh, another great win. So lots to talk about. Yeah, there is tons to talk about. Obviously, Green Bay moves to nine and three. They finally get their bye week. I kind of want to kick things off there because it's an interesting timing of the bye week. Uh, uh, let's start with that. Like, when did you prefer the bye week? Did you prefer a later season, mid season, early season? Was there ever a perfect time to have a bye, or was it just whenever it came you were you were thankful? I was going to say there's always a perfect time to have a bye. Right. You look at the other way. You know, I I would look at it this way after. And again, when we had 16 games, I would kind of look at it after week eight, week eight and on from like week eight to week 13, we'd take what we could get. Cause you're usually, especially when we were green, Bay, you think about, you're going to make that postseason push, right? So that anytime you get after that to kind of rejuvenate, you always look at the season from this perspective as a player, you're running on, you're running on high octane fuel. When you first start out, like you feel great, right? Body feels wonderful. You're not, the doldrums haven't you know set in. And then, like, I've always said November is kind of the worst part of the year for, for an NFL player because it's there's there's these – it's right in between that time where the first eight games you feel you're, you're energized and now you're just grinding these things out and you have to start setting these markers of what to look forward to, whether it's the playoff push, whether, you know, back in the day it was the, like, all-star voting, like, whatever you, those new that's the next landmarks were, you're just really trying to get to December so you can make the December playoff push. So I think any time during this – this period right now is good for the Packers. No, it certainly seems so. It certainly seems to be hitting at the right time. Obviously, Devondre Campbell goes on the COVID list and he could potentially be back now for their next game because it's a buy. Aaron Rodgers' toe. You've still got Jair and Bakhtiari and Zedaria Smith trying to recover. So, and just, you know, obviously nine and three. Is, is there ever anything, I don't know how much of a believer in like momentum that you, you know, you are, but like obviously they've been playing great. Now they need a buy no matter what. I'm not saying that, but um, does it ever kind of, you know, ruin or disjoint what might be going on so far in the season, or can you basically pick right back up where you left off? It probably depends on the coaching staff and how they handle it. I think that makes probably makes the most difference. And one thing you never liked coming off of a buy, it usually depended on who your staff was, where you were in the season, and what your record was. Is they'll try the coaches want to sneak an extra day in on the back end of that bye week. They want to get that Monday, that Monday work in. So I think if you if you just treat it like it's just another week going into that next week, it makes it makes life a lot easier. Um, and then obviously the responsibility of the team as far as what they did during the bye week, how, how much they enjoyed that bye week. Right. Makes a lot of difference because you, you just want to be able to show up the next Wednesday ready to go regardless. Yeah, it's been interesting. Green Bay's been 0-2 following a bye under Matt LaFleur. Those have been two of the tougher teams they've faced, usually coming off a bye a little bit different with Chicago coming up, but something to keep an eye on nonetheless. Speaking of which, Green Bay is nine and three. They're playing really great football. You know, obviously they beat some of the best teams in the NFL. Um, I, to me, their losses that I don't know how you felt about that Minnesota game, but I feel like if they played that game a hundred times, I think they win that game more often than not. I love the pressure they got. They just dropped some interceptions that normally I think they would have. I didn't, I didn't hate the way they played in that game. The chiefs game, they didn't have uh, Aaron Rodgers, Of course, I think if they have him, they win that game and the saints game. I completely throw out. That didn't look anything like the, the, the current iteration of the Packers. But this is obviously a very good football team one way or the other. In your eyes, just based on the film that you've watched so far, what are some reasons that you're maybe a believer right now that this team can be Super Bowl bound? And what are a couple of things that are maybe holding you back to saying, all right, they're the Super Bowl favorites? Well, first of all, I think chance is always it plays a huge part of this, right? When when you know opportunity is when when uh, or luck is when opportunity is preparation, but I think the biggest thing is, and it was evident in the Rams game, is Aaron Rodgers is just a next level right. quarterback right now. If you look at the push that the the, the defensive line, and, you know, Aaron, I love getting on the, you know, the, I get on Twitter now and I see all these people talking about how the PFFs, you know, non contextual intelligence win rates and all this nonsense, and this guy's better than this guy. Dude, Aaron Donald's an absolute beast. He got pocket push all day. He was beating guys left and right, or you know, trying to beat double teams. But Aaron Rodgers can throw off his back foot. And what a lot of people don't understand about the sport now versus I mean, 20 years ago is that the traditional pocket cup has changed, right? Under center, you take five-step drop, you, put your, you plant your foot at seven and a half and throw the ball. Aaron can go anywhere now when he takes that ball from shotgun, he can be all the way back at 11 yards planting that back foot. So 
just the time to get back there, the rhythm that he throws on, the, the kind of routes that they're running, like everything is designed to offset that pass rush. And Aaron's so good at identifying immediately where to go and getting that ball out from any angle, from any foot position, as far as where his balance is. Like when you watch him throw, he it, it's amazing how he can throw off his back foot and get that hip around so well compared to other quarterbacks in the league. Like he's just, he's 31 other quarterbacks would have had a real problem on Sunday and he dominated. I mean, he's that, he really is that good. So that's the reason I think they're going to play, obviously that and the defense playing so well. I'm um, glad you but, brought that up. I felt the exact yeah. same way. We'll get to the offensive line in just a moment, but uh, I didn't think the offensive line did great in this game. And again, a lot of that's due to the fact that you're going against Von Miller, Aaron Donald, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But I was, it wasn't even necessary to bring it up to, to bash on the O-line as much as it was to say Rodgers was phenomenal in this game and playing off platform. The other thing I think that was so impressive and even in the, in those Rodgers 2018, 2019, 2017-ish seasons, you would see, you know, you know, whether it was a, a Byron Bell, a Justin McCray, there'd be times where the offensive line was collapsing. And just after time, Rogers eyes started to drop a little bit and started to watch the rush a little bit more. I thought he did such a tremendous job in this game of, of just getting the ball out, distributing, keeping his eyes downfield. There was maybe one or two times where if he would have stuck with a route a little bit longer, where he would have had the time to maybe connect it. But more often than not, he felt the pressure. He knew when he needed to get rid of it. He used his check downs when he needed to. I just thought, it was a masterful performance from him yeah for sure and, and you just think about what are defenses trying to do across the national football league right now they're making they're trying to make you go the distance yep. they're basically saying that i don't think you can put together 10 and 12 yard drives or 10 and 12 play drives without making a mistake and what aaron Rodgers is doing now maybe that he wasn't doing as earlier in his career is not that he's less ambitious but he's okay hitting singles and doubles you know every once in a while and again, like you go back to route selection just looking at the routes that those guys are running versus the rams the rams have a struggling quarterback and they start the game off by running crossing routes. Like, you know, that, that take time. You have to hold the ball. You, throw it, you have to throw it through windows. Aaron's running speed cuts. He's running goes. He's throwing into space or he's throwing in a static position. Like everything makes – everything they're doing makes sense. You get the ball out fast. You can throw and run them on a three-step. You can throw and run them on a five-step. Everything they did offensively – and, again, just it's almost a, a very similar game plan to last year's game when they played the Rams in the playoffs. And he had, like – one or two five-step drops in the first half with a legitimate five-step drops. I mean, you're game planning that for success. He's executing it to perfection. And it really does make a difference. It's something that people don't notice, but it makes a huge difference in the game. I mean, the difference between me having to run seven yards and me having to run 11 yards to get to you, worse, first of all, I don't know where you're going to be before the snap anymore, Right. you know, which changes my rush because everything on offensive defense alignment, everything's on rhythm. I'm trying to get you off rhythm. You're trying to get me out for them. If you don't know where the quarterback's going to line up, I already have won the first part of that matchup, right? So there's so many things that go into being successful, and then the offensive line has to play well, and then the receivers have to make plays. But Aaron's just – he's unbelievable. Yeah, this this was one of my favorite games watching of him this season for sure. Uh, I thought the other thing that kind of went a little bit uh, maybe under the radar is, you know, you're always looking for complimentary football. And I thought this game, the defense did a great job. Obviously, the fourth down stop. Uh, they had the pick six, of course, which gets them on the board without the offense having to do a ton of work. Um, you have the sack fumble by Rashawn Gary, which sets them up. You had the muffed punt where the special teams is able to get a, a turnover and get you in, in positive position. I thought overall, this was a, maybe their most like complete game. We can argue or whatever. It doesn't really matter, mm -hmm. but it was their most complimentary game where the offense set up the defense, the defense set up the offense, the special teams had a pretty solid performance outside of one field goal off the uprights. I just thought it was a very complimentary game from this team. Yeah. I'm always still a little bit worried about it. if you were going to say, what are the, what's the thing that's holding it back right now? You know, I know Randall Cobb had that bobble in special teams as well. I mean, you start, you start thinking what's the, what's been the consistent, you know, theme over the last four weeks, it's inconsistency with the special teams. Defensively, though, you know, Chris Hovan, when he was playing with the Minnesota Vikings, he was a little mic'd up one day and he just started yelling out, pressure equals picks. And I just always stuck with me because you know, everybody thinks you're thinking about sacks from a defensive line perspective. Because I know like our guys, Aaron Campman and all those guys are always like calling them, calling the uh, NFL front office, trying to get an extra half sack or whatnot. But pressure equals picks. And when you start looking at games like this one, like Douglas's pick, you think you think he wasn't feeling Preston? You think uh, Stafford wasn't feeling, feeling Preston Smith's back of his hand? Yep. I mean, pressure equals picks in this league. That's why pressures equate to turnovers, and they're so so important. And that's why the, I think that stat is starting to change a little bit more as far as 
how many pressures you get versus how many sacks you accumulate. It's such an important stat. Our guys are doing a very, very good job of making people uncomfortable, getting them off the spot. I mean, we could have had a couple more sacks. Less. I mean, I think Gary, even though he's playing kind of with his off hand now and left hand on, on Whitworth, he actually was, he had another holding call and he actually had a third sack coming up. He hadn't reached for it. Kenny Clark too, if he hadn't reached and just pushed the guy right into his lap, they both had two more sacks. So they're just, everything seems to be going the right way uh, against what I think is honestly, especially interiorly, in the interior line of the, the, the uh, LA Rams, I think plays at a pretty high level. Yeah. We did a pretty good job with them. And, and you can just see that getting Gary back, getting Zary Smith back when he comes, when he shows up here in a couple of weeks, you have a lot of weapons on that defensive line and that, and that box team. Uh, safeties are playing well. You just, you got to be happy if you're the Green Bay Packers. I remember when I was playing, we never had a defense that good, except for my first year with Reggie and the Roy and all those guys, right? When, yep. you know, but I'm talking about like the, the meat and potatoes when I was there with Mike Sherman's teams. Like our defense was never as good as it is right now for the Green Bay Packers. And it's exciting as a fan to be able to kind of project what that could look like in the playoffs. Yeah, very much so. And that's why Mike Smith, Packers outside linebackers coach, talks and preaches all the time about pressures and not to look at sacks because, yeah, a sack is, can be great, but – uh, you know, obviously there's so much positive that can come out of a pressure too, whether it's a throwaway, whether it's a holding penalty, whether it's an interception, there's just a lot of things that can go well when you're getting pressure on the quarterback. And it's not always just about sacks. Obviously I want to spend uh, a decent amount of time, you know, you're always, uh, you know, you can break down the game in a variety of different ways, but I always love hearing it from an offensive line standpoint. I want to go mm -hmm. back to this game because I think it's a really interesting conversation. You mentioned PFF and the win rates and things like that you go into this game sort of expecting the worst, right? You're going uh, without David Bakhtiari and Elton Jenkins and Josh Myers. Meanwhile, you're going up against Aaron Donald and Leonard Floyd and Von Miller. And on paper, this looks like a matchup that could legitimately wreck the game for Green Bay. And then you look at the stats post game and you say, all right, Aaron dropped back to throw 45 times. You only allowed uh, one, one sack, which was a zero yard loss, which Rogers sort of ran into a little bit. Um, you know, Dylan had a, a solid game and you look at everything. You're like, all right, that's way better than I expected. And I, and you have to almost give it a passing grade because of that. When I watched this game, as you mentioned, there's pressure coming from all over the place. You know, there's collapsing pockets. Rogers is having to throw off his back foot. Dylan, I think maybe gets to 3.5 yards per carry, but there wasn't a ton of holes and the majority of his yards were after contact. How do you evaluate this offensive line, which, I, you know, arguably didn't play well at all, but given the circumstances almost performed better than expected. Yeah. And I think, I think that again, contextual intelligence is so important when you evaluate these games and, and that's why it's just, that's why there's no better informant than watching tape. Right. And when you're playing against, let's just take Von, I think Von Miller's a good player. I think he was, I think at one point he was great. I think he's good now. Yep. I think Leonard Floyd's a good player. I'm not going to give him anything more than that. Aaron Donald is the absolute best defensive tackle I think I've ever seen. Yep. And he causes problems on every single, like if you're an offensive lineman, if you're double teaming, if you're single blocking, if it's a backside B, if it's a play side drive, if it's a pass pro, you are, you are anxious. You have a certain level of anxiety every single play that you probably don't have against other players. And he's just, he has that kind of deal. He wins probably 90% of his snaps that he wants to win, that he's not stunning out of or something. And it's just a question of, is the quarterback going to hold the ball? Is the running back going to make the wrong play? Or can he chase the ball down from, from the backside? So having said that, knowing that you're playing against like generational talent, I like the fight that we put up because really when it gets down to it, it's going to take Royce Newman getting thrown on, you know, maybe he gets thrown on the ground and all of a sudden Patrick comes over and, and puts, you know, puts the shoulder on him because John Runyon Jr. took over Patrick's guy because they know, hey, listen, 91 is not really a threat. This guy's a threat. So even though we're sliding to the left, I'm going to take a quick check. I'm going to go back and hit 91 and I patch it. Get over there and help. Him. So that kind of continuity is something that you're not used to seeing from a, a line that doesn't have that many game reps together, that, that doesn't have necessarily the experience that goes past this season. So I would give them from a preparation standpoint, what their coaches are doing with them. I'd give them high, high marks. I think in the reality is you're dealing with, an incredibly talented guy. Von Miller had some plays in the game that shows you how, how talented he is as well, even to this day. But you're dealing with an incredibly talented guy that is, I mean, if he's not impossible to block, he's pretty damn near it. 
and they did a pretty decent job. And again, we can just talk about this all day, but 31 other quarterbacks are taking more than one sack. 31 other quarterbacks are probably throwing the ball away a lot more. Yep. The guy is playing at a level that like, you just don't see guy. You don't see, you don't see athletes pick a sport. You don't see athletes play at a level that Aaron Rodgers played at last week. It just doesn't make any sense that he, that he can play with like ice in his veins like that. It was, it was nuts. I mean, you go back to the Chiefs game with Jordan Love, right? And the pressure that they were able to get and the offense just, you know, really fell apart. And I don't necessarily blame Jordan for all of that by any means. But as you mentioned, there's just not a lot of quarterbacks that can see that type of pressure and get, you know, get out of it either pre-snap and figure something out pre-snap or just adjust to it post-snap. And again, I thought I thought Rodgers was masterful in this game. And yeah, I, I think uh, I think the other thing that deserves a lot of credit here is is Brian Gutekunst and the scouting staff because when you're down, your top center, your top left guard, your top left tackle, we've seen in the past a this a Packers team where they just didn't even have the starters necessarily to to hold up at the you know in a game like this. But especially if you're down, you know, arguably three of your top four offensive linemen. Um, to be able to have guys who can come in and at least kind of hold the fort down while, until some of these guys get back. I think the depth on this offensive line has been very impressive. I agree with you. Um, I would just make the statement that I think Adam Stenovich Good point. deserves way more credit than maybe anybody else because from my perspective, just knowing, like, it's not like, um, let's, let's just pick Royce Newman as an example, Right. There are other teams evaluated him. Other teams probably had him similar draft grade, whether we pick him up or whether we don't, right? There's, there's, there's that guy on 20 other teams right. right now. It's just the ability of that situation, the position he's playing, the people he's playing with, the coaching that he's getting, the detail that they're coaching with, the thing that we just talked about, just that, that hey, man, we're going we're gonna to go out there and give it our best. I'm going to help you as much as I can. We're going to make this as easy a transition as possible. Like that, there's a lot of coaching that kind of goes unnoticed, I think, right now, because you do have a David Bakhtiari. You did have – I mean, you had a lot of guys that have been – you know, a Corey Lindsay. You have a lot of guys who played at big schools, really good players. Um, Elton, Elton Jenkins just kind of came in and, and just was was good, right? But Elton Jenkins went to a, a great college, you know, high-profile guy with high-profile coach down there. And I just really think Stenovich has done an amazing job. Just whenever you – Again, I don't know if we talked about this before, Andy, but if you look at two things to determine whether or not an offensive line is well coached, how are they on their double teams and how do they switch off games? Like take everything else off the, off the table. If you want to just know if a team is well coached, an offensive line, if they can execute double teams at a high level and they can switch off games at a high level, that's a well coached team. Right. And they are very, very well coached. No, it makes a ton of sense. I got to ask you. So, you're going up against Aaron Donald. If you have that opportunity as a guard mm-hmm. and you see Aaron Donald across from you, mm-hmm. how are you attacking him? What's your mindset? What a, What's your first thing that you're trying to do and accomplish in that game? So the thing about Aaron, so in offensive line play in general, it's a battle for real estate. So let's take everything else, kind of wipe everything you know about, about confrontation and just understand that I need to get to my spot under control before Aaron Donald does. I, whatever, wherever I determine that to be, if I want to flat set him, if I want to set what I call a line set, so a little more vertical set, I need to be able to get to my spot under control so I can do my whole read and react and interaction and have that song and dance with Aaron Donald. So I'm going to, I'm going to continually work my line set and I'm going to always use, I'm going to, he gives chest because of his, his height. You just have to play with a good hip hinge. You can't play up tall, but he gives his chest more often than not. I felt like I was pretty good with my hands but I just need to be able to punch and I need to be able to extend out and keep that distance. So when he's attacking me, he's not attacking me elbow and armpit. You find any good D line coach in the league. What do they say? I want to smell your breath before I make the move. I don't want him that close to me. So I want to keep him extended on that first move. And I kind of always want to force him into a second move. I feel if I can do that, it's not easy, but it's definitely doable. Gives you a puncher's chance against one of the best in the league and maybe gives your quarterback a little bit more time if they have to work to that second move. And what Donald is so that for like we talk about Devontae Adams release at the line of scrimmage, mm-hmm. Aaron Donald's the same at defensive tackle, like his first step and how he can win with either an arm or a swim. Like there's just so many ways he can do it. I, I can't even imagine like just like having to get out of my stance and then just see Aaron Donald making a move. So it, it's just incredible the speed and the power and everything that he's capable of. Yeah, but you you also look at he is also a consequence because he he's a very intelligent player. 
He's also a consequence of how poor you see some of the offensive line play in the National Football League now. And let's not even talk about post-snap. Let's just talk about pre-snap with the way that like tackles change their stance depending on which direction they're going to run. Like how many times do you see Aaron Donald backdoor the tackle and still make the play? Yeah. Like how do you think he knows that guy's coming? Because when he gets down in the stance, he just looks over here and says, oh, feet are squared up. He's staring at me, waits on that foot. Here he comes. You know what I mean? It's very, very – we give away so many tells. We lose the game so many times either with our, our pre-snap stances. I'm talking about just in trench warfare stuff. Pre-snap, pre-snap stances and then our initial footwork. Like the basic stuff of, of the sport, we lose so many games. We lose so many snaps that lead to so many games just because of those two things. It's crazy. Yeah, it's the game within the game and certainly fun to hear about and fun to watch. I got to ask you about Billy Turner. This has been a, sort of an interesting co- uh, conversation this week. So I know uh, we already talked about some of the win rates in PFF. As far as right tackles go, uh, the win rates, and I think this is per ESPN's metrics and next-gen stats, I think they had Billy Turner as maybe the, the fourth best right tackle in football when it comes to run block win rate and pass block win rate. I think PFF has him as a slightly above average right tackle uh, right now. I'm, I've been a little bit more down on Billy, but I trust your judgment in watching the tape, uh, mm-hmm. certainly more than any of the three things that I just mentioned, including myself. What's been your interpretation of Billy so far this season and how he's playing at right tackle? I think he's playing really well. Um, I really like what he's done in the run game in particular. Uh, the thing that I really like Billy as opposed to, I knew, him, I knew him years ago when he was in Miami. And Billy's just one of those kids where I, 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 he reminds me of this guy, Evan Mathis. Evan Mathis was an all pro but he got drafted by the Panthers and the Panthers just, they didn't know how to develop that talent. And so he kind of was a, was a journeyman for years. He ended up with, uh, with moreover with the Eagles and all of a sudden was like a two or three year all pro, like one of the best guards in the last decade. And while I don't know if Billy's had reached that level yet, I think that they finally found a group, a situation, a coach that can unlock his talent because Billy was always game for it. And that's what I love about Billy. Like even when he was struggling back in the day, the kid was always game to work, put in the work, put in the effort, had the right attitude. I love the way he moves his feet. Um, I love the way that he can kind of unlock his hips in the run game. I like the way that he settles and is able to run like unlock his hips and he's able to run with players in pass pro. You know, I think what they, what they ask him to do more often than not, he's on an Island by himself. You see now guys like Von Miller over there all the time. Billy has a couple of different sets that he's, he's learned over the last couple of years. When we talk about situations with, and playing with, with Rogers and the different launch points that he has, I think Billy when watching this game specifically, it was fun to see that he set a couple of different ways, depending on when the launch point was, how he wanted to keep the width of the pocket versus the depth. And it really, I thought it really gave guy like Von Miller a difficult time more often than not, because it always ends up, that you have to end up in some sort of bull or manufacture some like ridiculous spin move that you know is not going to work, but you ran out of options because again, you're off rhythm because the way that Billy's kind of giving a little bit of ground. So I really like the way he's been playing. Of course there's up and down weeks, but um, you know, what, what a find for, for Goody and, and, and the, the boys upstairs a couple of years ago, bringing him in and, and he's really just done a hell of a job for the Green Bay Packers. Yeah, not only that, but the ability to play multiple positions. I know he's been at right tackle these last couple of years, but we know he can play guard and he can probably play four spots along the line. And when you've got, you know, when you've got a coach that's dedicated to saying, you know, we're going to put the best five along the offensive line, when you've got guys like Elton Jenkins and Billy Turner that can play multiple positions to give you those options to maybe move some guys around, guy like Lucas Patrick who can play guard or center, Newman's played a couple different spots. So it, it just really opens up the ability to actually get your five best guys on the field because you have guys like that that can play multiple spots. And um, I actually think Billy's been better at right tackle than he was at right guard in his first season, which isn't always the case. I know that, you know, there's different skills for for different players, but um, I do think he's been better at right tackle. Completely agree with you. Yeah, he, he was playing guard uh, for years. And I, it was he was one of those guys you always kind of kind of closed your eyes and thought he might this might be a better position for him at right tackle. It just kind of fits his skill set and his body type. You know, body mechanics are different for every guy, but, you know, basically we all we all you know, as humans move the same, but the little nuances about our, our different body types are going to make one a little bit easier than the other. From a demeanor standpoint, Billy can play inside. I mean, he definitely has that tough and that mental edge um, it, with being a little more physical. 
But I think just because of the, his stride length and the way he, he operates from a knee and hip bend, I think that tackle position helps him a lot because he doesn't have to play as low into contact as he would inside. Yeah, I didn't uh, think of this ahead of time, but I got to ask you about this as well. Obviously, this was another start for Yash. He has, uh, again, some some tough matchups against him. W- where do you see Yash right now, and, and what do you see his ceiling as a player moving forward? Yeah, so I, I that's a tough question, I think, as a as moving forward. He seems to have – a he seems to have a pretty good set, a pretty good set about, and a pretty good demeanor about him. Um, I don't think the moment's been too big for him, which in a situation like the last week, if it was ever going to show, I think it would show there. Uh, I really like the way he's played. I think the thing that you look, when you start looking at different pass sets and different body types and then athletically where his ceiling is, because that's really what you're asking, you know, where his ceiling is maybe athletically, because I think they're going to strive to make him the best at that particular kind of pass set. And when we talk about left tackles, I think more often than not, we're really talking about can you can you defend the blind side, and when you set vertical like he does, the situations where it's that eleven yard drop and back foot in an eleven, you're going to be okay more often than not. But now when you get into that that you know that seven to that five that five step drop under center with a three step drop and he can't throw it on rhythm anymore, when you get that vertical, I think the time the, the situations he has problems is when people a go inside or b just try to collapse him in the pocket because he doesn't have that strength yet. That strength can be developed for sure. I think. It's just like basketball. You see, you see basketball players getting kind of bigger when they hit 27, 28 years old. Same thing happens in football. Those guys can still develop and keep growing, certainly get a lot stronger than they are now. So I think that can help. But that would be the only thing from a technical standpoint right now when I'm trying to develop this player. You might want to change from that much of a vertical set because there's situations for it, but that pocket can collapse very easily when you go back to the old cut protection and a five-step drop. So I'm sure there's people listening to this and thinking – you know, okay, this is a, you know, sort of a a peeling back the onion a little bit of offensive line play. And I'm sure there's people that are listening and they're like, I would like to know more about offensive line play, dig deeper into this. Anything that you recommend for anyone that would like to learn a little bit more about it, maybe a book, maybe uh, something on YouTube, maybe anything that um, you would highly recommend for somebody who wants to know a little bit more about the X's and O's and the trench warfare up front? Well, I mean, if, Last year, I did a series every week, Trench Warfare. It's on uh, it's on YouTube. It's Process to Perform. You can check those out. Awesome. You know, I don't think there's anything better than just watching tape. And so, when you can get a chance to watch like the end zone copy of film, if you're if you're a fan, if you're a play, or, you know, player, parent, or coach that just wants to learn more, the best thing to do is just go find end zone copy, have an idea, watch watch a single play, a single running play a single five-step drop, understand exactly what the defense is trying to do, and then go through every single player and look at the footwork. And everything starts with your feet. So just if you start there, if you start with the idea that as long as players are gaining leverage on their opponent with their initial footwork, start making a uh, – start tracking how often they gain leverage and how often they're successful. And you're going to start seeing these correlations just pop up like jump off the screen. If their body's square to the line of scrimmage, they have more success, regardless if they win with their hands or not. If their front toes pointed towards the line of scrimmage, they have more success over and over and over. So it's just, if you can just kind of focus in on one or two things while looking at those things, while looking at those clips in detail, you're going to learn a lot, even on your own. No, I totally agree. And I think the one thing you mentioned is watching a play and watching it through to completion and watching what everyone's doing on that play. I think another really nice exercise that I always try to do some point in the off season is to take uh, just some of the, the marquee players in the league and just watch their snaps over and over and just see all right, what are the best of the best doing. And especially um, I know Daniel Jeremiah talks about this all the time for anyone that breaks down like college tape or likes watching college players and you know, <coughs> doing reviewing the draft process is as soon as that's done and you've watched a bunch of college players doing it for a while. All right, now go back and recalibrate and watch some of the Aaron Donalds and the De- Devonte Adams and the Aaron Rodgers and some of these players and see how some of the best are best of doing it and, and how they're doing it and how they're winning. And that can be a, a really fun exercise as well. Yeah, for sure. When I was, when I was working with teams a couple of years ago, you know, we always had this idea of, of when we want to template, do we want a template based on the best players out there right now and how they're doing it? Like how, how does a, how does a coach or personnel staff want to grade a player? Grade right. a, I mean, a guy they're bringing in, whether it's a veteran or a rookie. And, you know, there's, there's certain types of athletes that can kind of get away with anything like Walter Jones, for example, best player I ever, I ever saw. 
and he could step with his left foot going to the right, do all this stuff, cross over, and still just dominate because physically he ran a four six five. There's not much you can do about it, but you also can't teach it, and you also it's going to be you're going to have a hell of a time coaching it. So you got to find those guys who are very very good, consistent, technically proficient, and figure out who those people are. Keep watching them, and then you can kind of base your reality on everybody else is doing. Because again, like I, I this is an outcome based sport clearly. But when you start looking at the process of stuff, now you can really start to be objective. Are they trying to do, are they doing things consistently the right way? And if you, if you can figure that out and stop kind of basing your grading on whether or not, you know, what, what the outcome of the game was, because there's 21 other people on the field that directly affect your performance. When you can stop doing that and start looking at the process, then you actually have a chance to learn something. Yeah, I talk about process all the time when I'm going through and, and watching and grading the plays and stuff like that. It, it'll be crazy because there'll be times where there's an awful play on the field, but I go out and I grade 10 of the 11 players in the positive and the overall the, yeah. the play grades as a positive, but you know, one guy maybe mixed something up, went left when he should have gone right, whatever the case may be. And I'm looking at this play and it's a huge negative play in the game that goes, but uh, and on paper, again, it grades overall as a positive because 10 guys did exactly what they were supposed to. And you just see, um, you see that happen from time to time, but it, it's a great point to, to judge based on the process sometimes and not always the conclusion. And it's a good way to look at it. Mike, phenomenal stuff as always. Where can we follow you on Twitter? What are you working on? Where can we get more Mike Wall in our lives? Yeah, so I actually just changed my Twitter handle because I, I was having to answer too many questions. So it's just Mike Wall 68, uh, Mike W-A-H-L-D 68 on Twitter, process to perform on Instagram. Uh, you can check us, uh, all the stuff I'm doing at process to perform.com. And, and certainly we have our process to perform podcast comes out player development podcast every week. And then the on my block podcast with Packers all time leading rusher, Amon green. We put out every week as well. So those are the, uh, those are the things we're into at the moment. Awesome. Appreciate it, man. Have a great week. We will touch base next week. Uh, as soon as, assuming we can uh, find a, a perfect time for both of us that works, but, uh, always enjoy talking to you. Always enjoy breaking it down. We'll touch base soon. For those of you who are listening, make sure to follow Mike on Twitter. Make sure to subscribe to the podcast if you haven't already. But until next time, and as always, Go Pack Go.